from gab.com, a thread by J.B. White. For the sake of discussion, I want to entertain the Q idea of 11.3, as discussed in this recent Vox Day blog post, and approve of it in recognition that hopium, after all, is merely another word for faith. And in this earthly realm, faith matters, especially in this era of 21st century warfare. As a note, the Vox Day post is contained in my Hopium threat, uh, my Hopium uh, live stream from January 21st. I want to frame my discussion thusly, and it pulls from theories floating around the country, mashed up into a basic thrust that pleases me, and I don't give a damn if it pleases anyone else. A. Trump has outsmarted the global reset crowd and successfully thwarted their attempts for a new world order based on the same old, same old. B. Trump said no to the globalists, the bankers, the Wall Street crowd, the City of London crowd, the Vatican Bank money launderers, etc. C. The Trump administration has said yes, however, to the nation states willing to follow international norms for world commerce. D. Trump has said no to the lying, cheating Chinese Communist Party. The CCP is in an unavoidable death spiral, and the Chinese people will have to figure out whether they can move forward under international trade rules or stupidly crash and burn their economy. E. All of this means that Trump has, in fact, counterintuitively signed off on a different kind of global reset. F. Two of the foundational statements for this worldwide reordering are his executive orders 13848 and 13849. G. Conventional wisdom determined that these orders had the Chinese Communist Party and globalists like Soros Inc. as its primary targets. H. The lead target, however, turns out to be a corporate entity known as the United States of America Incorporated. This entity utilized legally available tools from the world of commerce to address American-owned debts without proper authorization from the nation from WE THE PEOPLE, all in caps, via the ACT, of 1871. Letter I. In response to a devious act of war designed by the CCP and its allies to crash our economy, and that of the larger world, Donald Trump and his administration instead brilliantly restructured the entire world economy, thereby saving countless trillions of dollars for Americans and a large number of people and institutions around the world. J, in response to the CCP act of war, he and his team took advantage of a worldwide crisis to stabilize world finances and punish the wrongdoing vultures who have treated the American taxpayer collectively as a carcass deserving to be devoured. Our very stable genius accomplished this by folding the Fed into a place where it always should have been, the Department of the Treasury, under the direct control of public service agents directly beholden to an elected official owing only a duty to we the people. Letter K. This action followed consistently with an evident Trumpian logic flowing directly from his rise as a candidate for president. Letter L, that logical flow. President Trump disrupting decades of multinational financial interests who use the United States as a host for their ideological endeavors. 
He did so by confronting multinational corporations and the global constructs of outdated economic systems that were put in place to the detriment of their much needed host, the American taxpayer, letter M. And all of this has been weirdly made possible by that corporate entity known as the United States of America Incorporated, letter N. So, the solution to a crazed world debt bankrolled without our assent by, for the most part, the American taxpayer, letter O, a twofold argument at least, letter P. Argument one, that corporate entity, the one that claims to be the District of Columbia, is illegal, and letter Q. Did y'all see what I did there? Argument two, that corporate entity is effectively controlled by foreign interests who just interfered again in our national elections. Now that the stage is set, this idea of the corporate entity being illegal arises out of the great nationwide dissatisfaction with our political, intellectual, and vocational credentialed class. These are the unworthy bastards who directly led to the absolute need for the core of America, Republican and Democrat, to hire a strategic warrior such as Donald Trump. I will go forward in my attempt to illuminate the 11.3 or 11.3 theory with a few copy and paste posts from the United States Department of Defense Law of War Manual. Keep in mind as you read these copy and paste selections that many Americans now believe one, America's capital given these illegalities harboring a foreign presence in our midst has temporarily been relocated to Mar-a-Lago with President Trump or wherever he is ensconced, and two, that as chief executive, President Trump issued an executive order in March of 2020 in response to the CCP virus situation that effectively placed FEMA in a lead position, operating on behalf of and on the orders of the president who is merely affirming his duty to us, we the people, to deal with all situations arising out of an emergency, in this case, the CCP virus emergency, including, unbeknownst to many in the deep state, any military or National Guard entities needed to address said national emergency without any legal duty to follow ordinarily applicable laws such as, for instance, criminal law protections or procedures. For a refresher course on the tremendous fear within the left wing on the powers of President Trump in a national emergency, take another look at this article from a mainstay of the left wing media. Link in the thread to The Atlantic, and it's called The Alarming Scope of the President's Emergency Powers. So, while the President sat and sat and sat on massive emergency powers. He did not actually sit on said powers. He simply, as a stealthy and very stable genius, delegated massive emergency powers nationwide to an executive branch agency under his direct control, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA. And any elements of the American force deemed by FEMA and the president as needed for the tasks at hand. FEMA, of course, supports citizens and emergency personnel to build, sustain, and improve the nation's capability to prepare for, protect against, respond to, recover from, and mitigate all hazards to the nation. Thus, following the 11.3 narrative, the need to resort to referencing the DOD Law of War Manual, 
we've not only been under attack from the CCP via its virus warfare, we've also been under attack from elements of a banking system mafia desperate to maintain control of worldwide economies. I submit, ladies and gentlemen, we've seen enough evidentiary proof during the Trump presidency, have we not? It's time to kill the beast. The current occupation of the District of Columbia controlled enemy territory within our midst is apparently how we're going to do it under this 11.3 theory. Here begins my selection of snippets. Mere physical presence of a belligerence military forces, belligerence, B-E-L-L-I-G-E-R-E-N-T apostrophe S, belligerent being a noun, military forces in the territory of its enemy alone does not constitute military occupation. Such presence might not constitute an effective and firm possession of enemy territory, or the belligerent state might lack the intention to displace and substitute the enemy state's authority with its own. The practice of conducting military occupation is very old, and the law of military occupation has long been part of the law of war. Military occupation is also called belligerent occupation. The conduct of military occupation has also been characterized as an exercise of military government or martial law. Winthrop, Military Law and Precedence, 799, quote, by military government is meant that dominion exercised in war by a belligerent power over territory of the enemy invaded and occupied by him and over the inhabitants thereof, ex parte milita uh, Milligan, 71 U.S. 2, 141, 142, 1866, Chase, C.J., separate opinion, quote, there are under the Constitution, three kinds of military jurisdiction. One to be exercised in both peace and war. Another to be exercised in time of foreign war without the boundaries of the United States, outside the boundaries of the United States, or in time of rebellion and civil war within states or districts occupied by rebels, treated as belligerents. And a third to be exercised in time of invasion or insurrection within the limits of the United States or during rebellion within the limits of states maintaining adhesion to the national government when the public danger requires its exercise. The first of these may be called jurisdiction under military law and is found in acts of Congress prescribing rules and articles of war or otherwise providing for the government of the national forces. The second may be distinguished as military government, superseding as far as may be deemed expedient the local law and exercised by the military commander under the direction of the president with the express or implied sanction of Congress. While the third may be denominated martial law proper and is called into action by Congress or temporarily when the action of Congress cannot be invited and in the case justifying or excusing peril by the president in times of insurrection or invasion or of civil or foreign war within districts or localities where ordinary law no longer adequately secures public safety and private rights. End quote. J.B. continues, this manual uses the terms military occupation, belligerent occupation, and occupation to refer to situations governed by the law of belligerent occupation. Winthrop, Military Law and Precedence, 799, quote, the authority for military government is the fact of occupation, not a mere temporary occupation of enemy's country on the march, 
but a settled and established one. Mere invasion, the presence of the hostile army in the country, is not sufficient. There must be a full possession, a firm holding, a government de facto. 11.2.1 Dot three, scope of occupied territory. The occupation extends only to the territory where such authority has been established and can be exercised. 11.2.4, proclamation of occupation. Due to the special relations established between the civilian population of the occupied territory and the occupying power, the fact of military occupation and the territory over which it extends should be made known to the citizens of the occupied territory and to other states. 11.3. End of occupation and duration of Geneva Convention obligations. The status of belligerent occupation ends when the conditions for its application are no longer met. Certain Geneva Convention, here and after GC, obligations with respect to occupied territory continue for the duration of the occupation after the general close of military operations. JB's voice now. This, ladies and gentlemen, means we're at the end of said occupation. The corporate entity known as the United States of America, Inc., is bankrupt because its assets have been seized. The corporate entity as such has been extinguished and the inauguration show was just that, a show. Back to Winthrop, Military Law and Precedents, 801, quote, the status of military government continues from the inception of the actual occupation till the invader is expelled by force of arms or himself abandons the conquest or till under a treaty of peace the country is restored to its original allegiance or becomes incorporated with the domain of the prevailing belligerent. 11.4 legal position of the occupying power. Military occupation of enemy territory involves a complicated trilateral set of legal relations between the occupying power, the temporarily ousted sovereign authority, and the inhabitants of occupied territory. The fact of occupation gives the occupying power the right to govern enemy territory temporarily, but does not transfer sovereignty over occupied territory to occupying power. 11.4.1. Right of the occupying power to govern the enemy territory temporarily. The right to govern the territory of the enemy during its military occupation is one of the incidents of war. By the fact of occupation, i.e. the occupying power's established power over occupied territory, the occupying power is conferred the authority to exercise some of the rights of sovereignty. The exercise of these sovereign rights also results from the necessity of maintaining law and order, indispensable both to the inhabitants and to the occupying force, and the failure or inability of the legitimate government to exercise its functions or the undesirability of allowing it to do so. That's all, y'all. Remember, a very healthy skepticism should be applied to this theory and every pronouncement made these days. We're being lied to. We may have been lied to for quite some time, but we're hip to it now, thanks to President Trump. Others can take the ball from here and support this theory or disabuse us of its probity. Whatever the case, there's plenty of food for thought in support of it 
given the craziness we've seen revolving around the blatant, nonsensical attacks on the presidency of Donald J. Trump. Has he outsmarted his presumed superiors yet again? I think he has. And I think he has done so, surprise, surprise, by keeping his promise to return power to we the people. If this theory is anything remotely close to being accurate, Trump will easily go down as our greatest president ever. Ever. Even if ultimately wrong, much of the Q exercise has been designed, it seems to me, to engage the American population, to highlight questions that need to be asked, answers that need to be demanded, and removal of officials who will not do so. Consequences, in other words, for actions taken or not taken. Most importantly, it seems geared to make us contemplate our world historic constitution once again, the founders once again, and the revolutionary experiment that is the United States of America. I will close with this note on the debt issue. The debt being reorganized and in many cases likely to be extinguished is more than likely for nation state debts. However, with an eye on a particularly devious domestic debt situation, I have a suggestion related to our intractable student loan debt situation that makes sense to me. For those people deeply in debt, a debt incurred in many cases based upon outrageously wild expectations, overhyped by an out-of-control higher education industry, and criminally buttressed by Congress and our chief executives, I would extinguish their debt outright. Further, I would make this move right with the people who labored long and hard, did the right thing, and managed to pay off their student loan debt by extending to them credits constituting cash equivalents or other benefits representative of a healthy amount of debt that was paid off by them. Nationally, this creates a two-sided coin, full of moral benefit, or so it appears to me. On one side, a worthy party benefits from their diligence or circumstantial good fortune, while on the other side, average Americans are set free from shackles by freeing up their money obligations to vultures in a collection industry that provide nothing of substance to the nation. Later, Gators. Follow Rattler Gator on Gab. Uh, and if you would like to support Gab, become a Gab Pro member. To support this channel, there are links in the description, of course. And I've, I will be doing a live stream tonight on how do we tell what's true and false? What is epistemology? I will be the greatest president that God ever created.